Bibles with me today. Turn to the first gospel, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. And I had uh, Bobby put 31 through 35, and I want to back up to 30. So we're going to read 30 through 35. Emily McNeish, how is school going? Is it good? Well, it's good to see you today. Right. Matthew 26, 30 through 35. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will let go before I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the divine, inspired, infallible, and inerrant word this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for the great text of John 3.16. Lord, we thank you for your Son. And Lord, and Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us at Calvary. And Lord, I thank you for each soul that your Holy Spirit beckoned and brought here today. Lord, we ask that you would open up each of our heart, mind, and ears to listen, Lord, to uh, the words that you will have spoken today. And the Holy Spirit, I need you. I can't do this without you. Oh, Lord, I ask that you would just be with me as your vessel, that you would just uh, uh, put the words in my mind and anoint my lips uh, so that every word that is said is uh, coming straight from you. Oh, Lord, we lift up every prayer request and petition today, Father, we ask that it will be done. And Lord, we pray for a president, our leaders, our nation, each person at every level of government, uh, Lord, that you would strike to their hearts to do that which is right and to spurn that which is wrong, according to uh, your word and in your eyes, Father. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for our military personnel at home and abroad, for our first responders, Lord, in our community church and in our community and beyond, that you would bless them, Father. And Lord, we ask you to be with your people, Israel that you would protect them and be with them, Lord. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as you instruct us that we're to do. Now, Father, Lord, we give, commit this time to you, Father. Now, Lord, we willingly do so. Lord, we ask that when each one of us leave your house today, that we can all say with one accord that today it was indeed good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today's message is, if I had it to do all over Again, that thought or statement, most times, and I think in most cases, is uh, said or thought of and associated in a negative way, with negativity. Yet, it can also be positive in, in nature as well. I'm going to concentrate on uh, some of the light of Peter, the Apostle Peter, here in this message uh, today. Because I think that Peter in his life had moments of both, where he would have said, if I had it to do all over again, and he, I think he could have drawn some positive uh, moments from life, and I think he also uh, would have been uh, very apt uh, to draw from negative matters that had occurred along the way. Peter more than once rode the emotional roller coaster of life. Has anybody else ever experienced that? Yeah, I think a lot of us, huh? Like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. Peter experienced that. In today's text, I think we'll see, and we saw, that uh, Peter definitely held the former, yet when it was all said and done, he experienced the latter of the negatives and the positives. Now imagine, if you will, we've all probably done this before. The picture of the upper room with Christ and, and his disciples. Now, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble today, 
but I'm going to uh, if, if needed. The picture in the, the famous painting that we uh, look at in we, when we think of the Lord's Supper, and I bet you all of us are thinking similar things as far as that picture goes. That's not really how it was. All right, that was, a, that was the European uh, idea of what the Lord's Supper was. But actually, in truth, they would have been gathered in a semicircle. They would have been pillows uh, or, uh, that they, they would have sat on or, or bigger ones that they would have leaned back upon to rest. And the table um, would have been very low to the floor. Uh, so that's the vision that I want you to, to have today. And again, um, if I'm rocking your world, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, but th this picture would be the reality of it. So I want you to picture this. And as they're sitting there, and they're, part they're partaking of the Passover meal, Jesus took a cake or a, um, a loaf of unleavened bread. And the scripture tells us that, that he broke it. And I picture him breaking it in half. And when he did, he passed it among his disciples. And as he was doing so, he told them something profound. He said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And then I think he followed that up with maybe something even more profound or unsettling to the disciples. He said, this night, this night, one of you is going to betray me. And one by one, I can picture that the, the fear ripped the hearts of each one of those disciples. If, you have, if someone ever said something in, in, uh, in your stomach just a flop, or when you hear something, that's what I envision that it was going on with these disciples. And one by one, all 12 of them said, is it, is it me? Lord, is it I? Am I the one that's going to betray you? And Jesus then said, he said, I'll give you a clue. And it was a heavy clue. He said, the one who dips their bread in the bowl in the gravy with me, that's the person that's going to betray me. Well, history tells us we know who that ended up being. Right? Anybody who was that? That's right. Judas Iscariot. <clears throat> now, this probably has absolutely nothing to do with the message. It's just, um, you know how, how I get sometimes my wheels spin and I kind of look, try to go deeper in the, in the areas of story, biblical storylines and things. You know, the scripture tells us that John sat at the right hand of Jesus uh, during this Passover meal. And if, and if you understand uh, the, the scriptures, that's an important place. It's a place of honor to be at the right hand of a king or uh, a ruler or whatever title that person might have had. I wonder, was Judas sitting directly to his left? Just get for our wheels to spin. Because in order for him to be able to put his bread in the same bowl that Jesus had, he had to have been, I believe, very close at hand. So that's just something just to get your wheels spinning uh, a little bit. Now, so now I now um, I can see that we're going to think of the Lord's Supper and we're going to look and say, okay, that was John. Now, Philhart said this was Judas, the guy right beside him here. No, I didn't say that. I said there's a possibility uh, of that uh, there. But um, but anyways, it just just something I wanted to share with you. So, but anyways, it was Judas. Jesus looked at his disciple and he said, whatever thou doest, do it quickly. Whatever you're going to do, and we, we both know, Judas, what you're going to do, but just go and get it done. Do it. So he basically dismissed Judas from the disciples right then and there, didn't he? Okay. So the meal was done. They sang some, uh, some songs. Now remember from the, the, the past message. I might have even said it last week, but I don't remember a whole lot from last week's message, to be blunt with you. Um, that, um, the, 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 we call them psalms, but they would have been singing uh, psalms uh, from the book of Psalms. That was, the, that was what they generally 
uh, did in uh, the Jewish tradition. Uh, so they, they sang a song, and then the Jesus and the 11 remaining disciples, they left Jerusalem, they took a, sh a short walk to what we call in, then and now is the Mount of Olives. Jesus once again gathered those remaining disciples around him. And again, he spoke very profoundly to them. He said, tonight, all of you are going to be offended by me. And in other words, and this is according to something, and I'm only going to say it once because if I say it twice, I'm probably going to get tongue twisted with it. But according to the King James Version Dictionary of Definitions, don't ask me to say that even two or three times fast. Because you know what's going to happen. I'm going to trip all over myself. But according to, uh, to this, what Jesus was saying was, every one of your cautious is going to be tried this night. Every one. Your loyalty is going to be challenged this night. Your obedience to me is going to be challenged tonight. In fact, it's going to be hindered by your fear. And if you didn't say this, I'm adding this. And because of your self-preservation, you're going to be in that mode. You're going to be thinking of saving yourself this night. But then he continued by telling them the reason it would happen. And he, Jesus drew this from the Old Testament, from the book of uh, Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 7. Now, this is just, this is part of this verse, but it's the part that Jesus drew from. Zechariah said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Those were profound words, weren't they? And, and I would have to imagine if I'd have been a disciple there, it would have scared the daylights out of me uh, what, what Jesus was, was uh, telling uh, me and those around myself. But then Jesus kind of did a 360, and he said, but, but when I rise again, I'm going to be out ahead of you in Galilee. Well, would you agree with me that that Peter was a bit of an impetuous person. I think he was absolutely <laughs> an impetuous person. So Peter spurred it out, re reacting to what Jesus said. And he said, never, Lord, never. Maybe the rest of these guys might turn their back on you. <laughs> and they might be uh, offended of being a part of you and you, you, in uh, your kingdom, then not me. There is no way I will be offended of you. I'd never do that, Lord. And then we find that Jesus responds back and says, Oh, really, Peter? Do you really believe that? Because let me tell you what's really going to happen. You are going to deny me three times within the course of an hour. And when you're done doing that, there's going to be a reminder to you that you did so. Because a rooster is going to crow in the middle of the night. And when you hear that, you're going to know that you betrayed me. I don't think those are words I would have wanted to hurt if I'd have been Peter. Well, then we see that Peter then, being impetuous or... Uh, being reactionary, I believe without even thinking again, said, no, there's no way. Listen, Lord, if I have to die right beside you this night, I'm never going to give you up. I'm loyal. I'm there. And then the other ten disciples chimed in and they began to follow suit. No, Lord, no, I won't leave you. I, won't, I, I will not do that. I can't do that to you. So we then see that Christ left seven disciples at the entrance and the gates heading in and leading into the Garden of Gethsemane. He took what we know were his three favorites, is how I'm going to say it, disciples, Peter, James, and John with him. And he took them for a reason. I believe they were his closest prayer partners. And I believe he took them specifically so that they would be near to him 
so they could be praying for him intercessory, in an intercessory way, on Jesus' behalf. So we all know the drama that took place then. And after Christ's internal and external battles with the forces of, of Satan, a mob appeared. Now, you know, the scripture calls it them a, a band. It wasn't a band playing music and stuff, right, Mike? It wasn't that kind of band, all right? This was a term that was used. And what it, was, it represented and meant that there were 600 men that came to arrest one man. <laughs> you think that was overkill? Uh, but Jesus immediately proved to them that he was greater even than 600 of them. Because we, we know in the word that he just spoke. And the power of his word was so mighty that it actually knocked everybody to the ground. How about that? So Jesus, I think, in that moment was showing them, I'm giving myself up freely. <laughs> right, you're not taking me. So in the midst of that happening, here we find Peter again. What does Peter do? He reacts. He draws his short sword out and whack, whacks off an ear of one of the temple servants named Melchius or Melchaeus. Jesus was not happy with that. In fact, he rebuked Peter. Now, you can't blame Peter for wanting to defend the Lord, can we? I can't. But Jesus said something to him that was a rebuke. He said, Peter, put your sword away. He who lives by the sword will also die by the sword. Jesus promptly healed that man and replaced his ear. And he recovered like nothing had ever happened. We know then according to scripture that a little, just a little bit of time passed. Jesus was taken to the inner court of the, of the temple. And he stood before Annas and Caiaphas and the members of the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night. And he had a kangaroo trial. And as Christ was in, uh, under duress in that trial, people in the outer courtyard to build a fire to stay warm. Well, guess who made the mistake of going and joining them to warm up his hands, probably? Peter. Three times, somebody pointed their finger at him and said, no, you're, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know you are because your speech, your speech gives you away. You have that Galilean accent, do you? I remember once on vacation, somebody said to me, they said, are you from Western Pennsylvania? Like, yeah, maybe, why? And they said, we always know people from Western Pennsylvania because you have an accent at the to your speech and to your voice. I don't pick up on it. The ends. <laughs> but his speech, his accent, his dialect gave him away. So what was Peter's response to all this? First, I don't know him. Then, I'm not his disciple. And then, Man, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm not even a Galilean. And then the cock and the rooster crowed. I don't know him. I'm not his disciple. I don't know what you're talking about, buddy. But I'm not even a Galilean. Three times he denied Jesus. And then the scripture tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly. I bet he did. I bet he did. So six times in just a matter of a few hours, Peter reacted in a reactionary way. You know, Peter was a very passionate person, wasn't he? You read the life of Peter. Peter was passionate in what he believed in. And I think he was just as passionate in what he didn't believe in. That was his personality and his character and makeup. But that passion oft times worked against him. 
because it caused him to be impulsive, brash, hasty, and spontaneous. Being so usually was not a positive for Peter. But albeit sometimes it was, too. I wonder how many times Peter thought to himself or even said it out loud. Even on that night that all this went down. If I had it to do all over again. If I had it to do all over again. As he wept after his denials. I can't believe he did not say it. I think he was beating himself up terribly. Perhaps he thought, I shouldn't have let my pride and my ego cause me to doubt Jesus' warnings about what I was going to do to him. Why? Why, whenever I knew what Christ had said, why did I wilt like a flower in front of that bonfire, that campfire? In front of those people, and when he questioned me about being Christ's follower, why, why did I wilt? This was Peter's character and personality. To me, it almost seems like Peter couldn't help himself. That that's just the way Peter was. That was him. Now here's some other, to name a few I should say, other impulsive in reactionary moments in the life of Peter. Not so good and good. Here's good. On the shores of Galilee. Hey, guys. Stop what you're doing. Come, follow me. And I'm going to make you fishers of men. What did Peter do? Dropped his nets, jumped out of his boat with his brother, followed Jesus Christ, become his disciple. Would you say that was impulsive? I sure would. He reacted to the words of Jesus. But that was a good thing. Here's what's not so good. Lord, no. No, you are not going to go to the cross and suffer and die. And what did that get him? Another rebuke from the Lord. How would you like Jesus to look you in the eye and say, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me? How would you like that? Now we know that he was speaking to Satan through Peter. Because then he said, Peter, don't let the devil sift you like wheat, man. Don't be so reactionary. Don't be so impulsive, Peter. And maybe Peter hung his head in embarrassment of all the rest of the disciples. And here's one that's kind of mixed. How about the night on a troubled, stormy sea when Jesus appeared walking on the water and they were all flipping out. It's a ghost. It's a spirit. Nobody, no human being can walk on the water and guess who it was that hollered out? Peter. Do you remember what he said? Lord, Lord, Lord. If it's you, if it's really you, then let me walk on the water to you. Impulsively, right? Jesus said, come on, Peter, it's me. So when Peter steps over the side of the boat, he started walking on water. And then it clicked to him, I'm walking on water. <laughs> And the doubts came in. And what happened? He lost his faith and took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to drown. Christ reached down with his hand and he pulled him up out and up. And he said, Peter, oh, you have little faith. Man, you were walking on water, brother. You took your eyes off of me, and that's why you began to sink. I think Peter learned a lesson from that, hopefully. But can you see that Peter's impulsiveness and his reactionary way that he dealt with things, it had good moments, it had not so good moments, 
And then there was a some in-between moments in his life. Now, there's a whole bunch of really other examples of Peter that we could have used, but those are the three that the Holy Spirit led me to. I wonder in each case, did Peter stop and think or say to himself, man, if I had it to do all over again, if I had it to do all over again, I'd have kept focused on Jesus and I'd have done something no other human being would ever have done before or ever after me. I'd have walked on water the whole way or at all. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have told Jesus, no, you're not going to the cross. I'd have kept my mouth shut. And I bet you there were other times that Peter very well could have said, if I could just do it all over again. There was negative and positives. So I'm going to ask you a question today. Have you ever said or thought those words, if I had it to do all over again? Have you ever thought or said those words? I have. I have a long life way. So what are some things that you could think of? Where you could have said those words. And I don't want you to answer me. I'm just going to suggest some things to you. Was it something that you said or didn't say? Was it something that you said? Excuse me. Was it something that you did or didn't do? Was it something that you saw or didn't see? Were there regrettable happenings? Were they regrettable or were they positive things? Perhaps there was a myriad and a mix of your answer to yourself. You see, Peter had no way, folk, of going back and changing anything that he had ever done. It was impossible. He couldn't go back and change what he had said, change anything that he had done, or saw the things that he had seen. Now, he could have asked himself that question, if I could go back and do it again. He could have asked himself that a thousand times, but it wasn't going to change anything for the fact he couldn't go back and do it all over again. Could he? There's no way that he could. Not humanly possible. Peter had to come to the conclusion and understanding at some point in his life that the past was the past. He couldn't change any of it. I think he had good memories, and undoubtedly, I believe that he had regrettable memories. That's living life, folk. That was Peter living life. But here's what he could do, and this is what I believe that he did. He could learn from the things of his past. He could draw from them. He could grow from each and every experience. And he could change the way that he was and he could change the man that he was. Could be. Could that be? An impulsive life and a reactionary life was that of Peter's impetuous life. That type of life can cause us, I think more than any other type, to say, if I had it to do all over again. Have you ever gotten yourself into trouble by not thinking clearly first? Have you ever gotten yourself into, into any muck and mire because you impulsively reacted to something? Have you ever had relationships in your life where you get stressed because you didn't take the time to really think about what you were going to do or what you were going to say? Maybe. I guarantee you it was for Peter. And along my life's way, 
I have struggled with being a reactionist. I'm an impulsive individual. I don't like that of myself. I don't like that. Because I've had too many times along the way that I reacted without thinking, and it did no one any good, myself included. I had one day that my wife said to me, she said, you need to remember who you are. Folks, that wasn't a compliment. Who was it, Susan? Oh, I promise you, you said it because I remember it. I shouldn't have to think and remember who I am. If I would take the time to think matters through and pray about them and not just here we are. That's a regrettable part of my life. It's one that I hope that I'm maturing with. Pray that I am. Once we say something or do something, it immediately becomes history, doesn't it? We can't get it back. But I'll tell you what we can do, and I believe it's what Peter did. We can grow from them. We can glean from them. We can draw from them. We can mature from them. Can we not? We can use those times in our life that we say, if I had it to do all over again, we can use those for our benefit and for everyone else's benefit around us. Because if we can discipline ourselves to do those things, we're going to be better men, we're going to be better women, we're going to be better boys, and we're going to be better girls. I'm not just speaking physically, I'm talking spiritually. It's a lifetime. It's a life. There have been times where I have thought, man, if I could just, if I could just change, change this, or if I could just have changed that, if I would have just been more thoughtful, if I would have been just less impulsive, if I would have washed my big fat mouth a little closer, it could have changed a lot of things. But the truth is, I, I can't go back and change them, but I can draw from them. I can glean from them. I can mature from them and grow from them. And hopefully, as time continues to pass, I'll be a better man for it. I'm going to challenge you today. Okay? If you ever ask yourself again, or say, if I could just go back and do it all again, don't say it with regret. Say it with hope. Say it with determination. Say it because you want to get better, that you want to grow, that you want to mature, that you don't want to make some mistakes of the past, that you want to become that better man and that better woman, boy and girl that you know that God wants you to be, mind, body, and spirit. I'm going to ask you from today forward you think those words, if I had it to do all over again, to get to a point in your life, your response to yourself can be, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. I do believe that Peter was able to do that. Did you know that Peter was arrested for a final time and taken to the capital city of Rome. He was put on trial 
He was condemned to death. He met his fate on a cross, just like the Savior had. But here was the difference. When he was about to be crucified, he said, and this is what historical things, we don't know that's true. It's, it's absolutely correct that history, church history tells us this. That he said that he didn't deserve to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. He asked to be hung upside down, crucified in reverse. Is it possible that as he hung there and, and, and his life was fleeting before his eyes and all the blood was rushing to his, uh, to his head and, and so on and so forth, did he have a fleeting thought of, man, if, if I had it to do all over again, would I have run? Would I have denied Jesus? See, he couldn't change anything at that point. But I have a funny feeling that Peter had matured to the point that at that crucifixion hour, he was able to respond in his own mind and heart to say, you know what? I wouldn't change a thing. And you know who the greatest example of them all is for us, and that's Jesus. As Jesus hung on his cross, Is it possible that he, he, he had a thought run through his mind? If I had it to do all over again. And his response, I believe, without any question, would have been, or perhaps was, we don't know. No, you're sure. I wouldn't change a thing. Because I completed my task. I came to see that which was lost. Say me. So you can save that which was lost, and I've done so. If you had to do all over again, what would your response be to yourself? I think that's a really honest question. Because it's certainly one that this Holy Spirit put uh, laid on my shoulders for me. If you ask yourself that, don't don't say don't think of it with regret. Again, think of it with hope and promise. Because God saved you and He forgave you of anything of your past. You're living now in the present, and you're preparing yourself, mind, body, and spirit, for the future. And as each and every day passes, grow. Mature. Become that man, woman, boy, or girl who you know very well that God wants you to be. If I had it to do all over again, the song says I'd say Jesus every day of my life. And if I had it to do all over again, I would still marry the same woman 34 years ago that I did today. I love you. Thank you. That's the message today. I hope you got something out of it. If I had it to do all over again. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love, sacrificial love, that agape love. Lord, we ask in, Father, in, 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 I believe with heartfelt uh, and Lord, utterances and pleas that you would help us, Lord, to, to, to glean and grow and grow from the past experience of life, pro or con, Lord, whatever they were. That you would also help us to understand that we can use those things to become a better Christian, a better believer, and a better child of God for today and in all of our tomorrows. Father, Lord, we ask, uh, Father, that you would watch over us, Lord. You would open doors for us, Lord, in this coming week to tell people about the great story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask, Father, you would be with each one of us, Lord, today and tomorrow as we complete this Labor Day weekend. Father, Lord, we ask that you would just help, that you would help us, Father, that you would guide us, you would prepare 
protective hedge about each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.